All right. Hi, Stacia. How are you? I'm just fine. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Nice to I'm have you. I'm delighted. So we're going to be talking about your book series here. I see it's a two book series, Lost yes. and Found in Tennessee. Uh, the titles are The Missing Girl and Jessa is Back. Is that That's correct. correct. Okay. Uh, before we get to that, though, can you give us a little bit of your backstory? Just tell us what you've been doing with your life uh, since you well, came to this I, earth. <laughs> I, I didn't start out as, as a professional writer at all. I'm a, a scientist. I was trained in invertebrate neurobiology and uh, studied crabs and snails and spiders and millipedes and insects. So I have a, a wide range of uh, invertebrates that I've cared about and studied. And I'm interested in their behavior. So I study the nervous system. And my husband and I were uh, trained, our PhDs were in uh, University of Miami. So we uh, had access to the mangrove swamps around Miami. And we uh, traveled way across the country to Washington State and, and established ourselves here. So that's where we've been living since the early 70s. I don't see a lot of stuff in jars on your shelves. Uh... <laughs> well, it was, it was not a preserve and I categorize kind of uh, science. It was more poke it and see what it does kind of science. So we had to have the living animals. Oh, okay. All right. So no formaldehyde. Around. No formaldehyde. <laughs> All right. So you did that as a career. Did you, you were a researcher or a teacher or? Both. 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 And it was interesting because you go back and forth, you have discouraging times in research and you can always say, well, I really love the teaching and I'll focus on that. And then teaching can be discouraging sometimes. So you turn back to the research, but uh, it's, it's nice to have both. So did you find anything earth shattering? I, I found out how crabs drop off their legs and get away. There's a specific motor pattern that they're, nervous system is triggered to generate that can just drop off a leg. And that was one of the things. But uh, with the snails, I studied nervous system regeneration. And these are remarkable animals. You can take an, a part of the nervous system out and it will grow back. And in the meantime, they make compensations just as we have to make compensations after a stroke. So it's, it's very interesting research. Do the crab legs grow back if they drop one? Yes, they do. It oh, takes several molt cycles to get a full sized leg, but they do grow back. What's the life expectancy of a crab? Varies depending on the species, but they can live to be six, eight, ten years, uh, the ones that I was working with. So they get to be quite large. And uh, I, I have seen enormous crabs. I think it must take many, many molt cycles to get that large, 50 or 60 years. Invertebrates are different in, in terms of how they age. They don't necessarily age the way we do with a, a specific lifespan. So is the king crab the biggest one, the Alaskan king crab? I think there's one in Tasmania that's even bigger. Well, we're going to make a hard pivot from crabs to your book. And right. uh, are both of these books out? Were they released together or did one come out yes, first? Yes, today, or? as a matter of fact, this oh. is the release date. And that you release both books on the same day? Yes, oh, okay. as the set. Uh, Lost and Found in Tennessee. Did you grow up in Tennessee? I did. This is a very much a memory based book. It is classified as historical, but uh, that's because I'm, I'm ancient history now myself. You said historical. Are they historical fictions? Uh, it is historical fiction. It is uh, based upon my memories of what it was like growing up in Tennessee, but the uh, plot is completely uh, imaginary. Is the same character running through both books or are they completely oh, yes. separate? Yeah. Yes, they, they are intended to be a sequel in which you pick up the life six months later. And then the third book in the series will be five years later. So I, I'm following the same character and her town. And the town is another part of the book, essentially another character. Who is the girl? Is it you? Jessa. 
The girl is is a stubborn girl like me. Was she was the character based on your life or not? Uh, not on my life. Uh, the character, the first thing that happens in the first book is that the family is uh, wiped out in a car accident. And so she has to scrounge for herself. She uh, runs away rather than going into foster care. And she takes her dog with her and they hide out for weeks and weeks. And what she doesn't realize is that the town has gone into overdrive of, of panic uh, as a result of her disappearance. And it, it upsets the racial balance, the, the quiet um, acceptance of, of everybody in his place kind of thing, because they pull a, a black mechanic into the uh, sheriff's office and say, you know, you, you've got to be a, a kidnapper. This is the reason you have to be the kidnapper. And of course, he's completely innocent, but uh, it upsets the balance between the two races and uh, leads to a lot of, of exposure of the Jim Crow era that uh, is more developed in the second book. So this, after, after she spends the time in the forest with her dog, uh, she's uh, able to come out of hiding and join up with part of the family that she didn't even realize existed. Uh, they were called in on, on the basis of the disappearances and she bonds with the family and leaves with them and goes to Portland, Oregon. And there she um, has a good friend who's black. And it, it completely revises her view of the world. And she comes back to Tennessee for her custody hearings. And she finds out that uh, she would never have had even been able to make the friend's acquaintance in Tennessee. The seg segregation is so complete that um, she the blacks and whites just don't overlap, except as a servant class caring for the white needs of the people. And that's that's the way it was in Tennessee. Let me, and uh, people, sorry, people I didn't mean to interrupt. It. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about that. So when you, when you were growing up in Tennessee, it was Jim Crow and it was segregated. It was, yeah. it was. Okay. So you, but the, you were, you weren't that old, right? Well, I was, I was as old as Jessa, and I could see the the white and black colored water fountains, the uh, restrooms that were separate, the lines on the bus that you weren't supposed to step across. Yeah, I I saw all that, and my particular family was not bigoted, but uh, we were ne nevertheless separated by the, the segregation of the schools and, and the, the living conditions. It was completely segregated. Let me ask you something about people's attitudes then. Were the, the whites generally, were they more bigoted or were they just, well, that's just the way it is and there's nothing we can do about it? There was some of both. Okay. Uh, I know that uh, my, David, my husband's uh, family, my his mother said, well, that's just the way it was, David. That's just the way it was. You just accepted that. You accepted the fact that a, a black kid might get killed by a policeman and people just accepted. It. Um, this, this is just the way it was. Okay. How is the, those sort of memories incorporated in your book? Did you use a lot of that? Oh, yes, I did. I wanted our children and and we tried to describe what it was like when we were growing up to our children and they could not believe it and so i wanted to give them a scenario in which they would understand the life of the times and what it was like to be trapped in either the white or the the black roles because it was very much what you learned from childhood on how to behave and and that uh, kind of thing I think um, underlies a lot of the uh, the damaging discrimination. It's just what you grew up with. People don't question it. And having a, a friend who was black made Jessica question it, and then she challenged her town 
I think you would like the part about the music. Uh, Jess's parents ran a music shop, and she, her father had been working with the school board to get instrumental music into the schools. So they took it and put it in the white schools, not the black school. And uh, she was determined when she got out of hiding to go back to her town and correct that, as her, she knew her father was planning to do. Uh, they were supposed to have schools that were separate but equal. And this is what the town had claimed they were doing. They weren't nearly separate as they were separate, but they were never equal in terms of the advantages that uh, the white kids got compared with the black kids. That, that's a big part of the, of the story. I was going to say it's too bad that they put the music programs into the white schools and not the black schools because the black music was better. <laughs> yes, the black music was better and that comes out yeah, in, hands in the down. story. Yeah. Um, I want to read something that's on your talking points here. We've got just about four minutes. Must love dogs. Talk about the role <laughs> of the dog in your writing. Well, second favorite <laughs> thing in my life to music is dogs. I've got two of them and they're right out <laughs> in the hallway here now. I bring them with me wherever I go, just about, anywhere yes. I can. So what about dogs? Dogs are essential. Dogs teach people how to be human. I, I think that dogs are, are angels in disguise. I agree. But uh, I, I really uh, have depend, depended upon dogs throughout my life. And in this book, Jessa depends upon her dog, Cassie. She's a, a standard poodle. And she depends upon her for warmth and companionship. And the dog is, is both those things and, and much more. And I, I think that uh, without the dog, Jessie couldn't have made it in her hideout. And uh, the dog goes with her everywhere. You said that there's going to be a third book coming out? Uh, it's in the, in the process. In yes. the process, OK. How many books do you anticipate are going to be in the series? I don't look beyond that third one at this point. I, I don't know, but it was that way when I was writing the first book. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know about the second book. So uh, it's, it's where the characters take me. We've got just about a minute and I wanted to ask, what was it that inspired you to start writing after all those years of uh, being a scientist and researcher? You know, I, it was a, a daydream, the, the self-sufficiency part of the book where Jessa is feeding herself from the garden and the orchard. And I, I liked the idea of self-sufficiency. But when I realized that I had a plot, that's when I realized I could write a book. And I didn't know until some, some parts of the story developed that I had a plot. And plot had always been a mystery to me. My mother was a writer of children's books. And I didn't know where her plots came from. Uh, I had always written reports and letters rec recording what was going on and never anything with plots. And plot is wonderful. And it just, it carries you along in writing. Uh, I have, I have uh, all kinds of wonderful experiences with the, the characters and how they drive me through the plot. Well, I think on that, we're gonna have to wind this down. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, the last question, do you have a website that you want to give out? Yes, it's called Lost and Found in Tennessee, all written in lowercase, dot com. And there you can, you can order the books, you can uh, read excerpts from the books. And I welcome people in Lost and Found in Tennessee. Well, Stacia, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice meeting you and chatting with you. Best of luck with Thank your you. book series. Hope yes, it does and, well. Yes, and enjoy your dogs. <laughs> I will indeed.